Okay. A um, couple things in terms of schedule. So the all the homework problems from Chapter 5 are due by midnight on Monday. So I'll give you um, some time to do that. And then the Chapter 6, when we'll get to that, I'll set a deadline for that next week. So well, what we want to talk about today is stereochemistry, and we want to get down to um, some of the different types of stereoisomers where you have four different groups attached to carbons, making those carbons chiral. So on Monday, I kind of defined the fact that a chiral carbon, or sometimes I'll call it a chiral center, is a carbon with four different groups attached to it. And if it has four different groups attached to it, you can't pass a mirror plane through that carbon. You cannot pass a mirror plane. So let me be very explicit in terms of a couple definitions. Number one is we're going to talk about today enantiomers. And so enantiomers are, a, are basically two molecules that are mirror images and not superimposable. So you have a so the enantiomers are the left and the right handed molecules. It do, they can have one or 20 chiral centers. So when we talk about enantiomers, we're only talking about two molecules. And if they both had, if they had two chiral centers, or three or four, or just one, they are themselves mirror images, but not superimposable. That's the, that's the definition of enantiomers. Now, every chiral center has a configuration and the configuration is the exact three-dimensional structure of a chiral carbon. And that configuration is either labeled as R or S. And we'll go through the rules for R and S today. But the first step in R and S determination is ranking the four groups that are attached to the chiral carbon through the con engel prelog sequence rules, which is why they came up first. Okay. So that's what we're going to first of all determine is, OK, I just drew a pair of enantiomers on the board. One's R, one's S, we have to figure that out. Because this is the way we tell somebody exactly what enantiomer we have. It's by saying I have the R or the S. In this case, this is 2-bromobutane, so I have the R2-bromobutane, I have the S2-bromobutane. Later on, we might have chiral centers and cyclohexanes, so I might say, well, we have the 1R2S, or the 1S, 2S, and so that's how I'm going to tell you exactly which configurations I have. All right, so these are the basic definitions, and we'll add a couple more on. So step number one is ranking the four groups according to the con engel prelog sequence rules. So of the bromine, the ethyl, the methyl, and the hydrogen, what's number one? Bro means number one. What's number four? Hydrogen. Hydrogen is always four. Now, molecules may not always have the four group being hydrogen, but hydrogen, when it's attached, is always number four. And then what's number two, ethyl or methyl? Ethyl. ethyl. So. Again, remember the rules, 
bromine versus hydrogen versus carbon versus carbon, bromine and hydrogen, bromine wins, hydrogen loses, the two carbons are tied, what's attached to this carbon? Three H's, what's attached to this carbon? Two H's and a carbon, two H's and a carbon wins over three H's. Okay. That's step one. All right. So then step two is that you want to orient the molecule so that the fourth, so that the number four position is away from you. In the older books, if you can imagine this tetrahedron, if I rotated the hydrogen group directly back, it would look like it would look like an old-fashioned steering wheel. Like old-fashioned without all the controls and without the airbags you know, 60s, of which it's just a history book for you. But this is called the steering wheel model. So when we orient the number four position away from you, what will happen is that the number one, two, and three groups will either be To go to number one, to number two, and number three is either going to be clockwise or going from one to two to three would be counterclockwise. Now I know there's going to be a day sometime in the future, probably long, I'll be long gone, when clockwise and counterclockwise won't mean anything because we won't have watches with hands. They'll be antiques but hopefully we're still at the point where people understand clockwise and counterclockwise. And I, I'm not joking about that. There's going to come a time when that's not going to be the case. Clockwise is R, counterclockwise is S. So our steps then, I de rank the four groups orient the fourth group away from me, and then determine is one to two to three clockwise or counterclockwise. Okay. So there's three different places where you can make a mistake. And if you make two mistakes, it might they might counterbalance so that you get the right R and S. Okay. So this is really kind of a 50-50 problem, but I would not come into an exam going, oh, it's 50-50, I can guess. Right, because it's 50-50 for every single chiral center. Right. So step two, how do I get the fourth group away from me? Well, in the molecule I gave you here, fourth group is away from me. How do I know that? It's on a dashed wedge. So whenever, whenever um, you have a dashed wedge, that's a position behind you. So in this molecule, fourth position is behind me going from one to two to three is clockwise in that molecule, so that's the R over here, going from one to two to three with the fourth position again on a dashed wedge is counterclockwise, so that's S. And it should be R and S because I wrote the mirror images. So the biggest issue is how do you get the fourth group away from you? What would happen if, and I'm just going to do numbers now, because that's really what it is. Once you determine one, two, three, and four, it's just a question of orienting numbers. So what, if, what would happen if the number four group was there, maybe one here, two, and three? Is this one R or S? And before anybody says anything, which I'd be amazed if you could come up with it that quickly, because I think you would even beat me. How am I gonna, what am I gonna do? Well, I'll, I'm gonna show you a number of different ways. Whichever way works for you is good. You need to do some practice problems in this because mm -hmm. if you get the practice problems all correct, then you know, it, then your system is working. If you get them all wrong, well, then you have an option. That means your system is, a, is failing 100% of the time, but you could continue to use it and just write down the other answer. 
the most deadly part is if you get it 50% of the time because then something you're doing is incorrect and it's causing you half the time to get correct and half the time not. So you have to try a lot of these, do a lot of these problems and make sure that you understand. And trust me, I've got plenty of problems on the Canvas site for you to do, including some really difficult ones that um, are really tough. So what can I do here? Well, I could imagine my I could imagine grabbing this molecule up here. So there's my hand, and I'm rotating number four into one, number one into three, and number three into four. So if you imagine you have a tetrahedron sitting on the table, if you grab the top one, you can rotate it. And as a matter of fact, if you grab any of these bonds, you could rotate the three into each other. So this one, if you imagine that you're down underneath it, you're kind of rotating the way you would a Newman projection. So if I, so if I rotate that, I'm going to end up with four in the back, one here, three here, and two didn't move. And so now my fourth position is in the back. Going from one to two to three is now clockwise, which means that chiral center is off. So that's one way to get the fourth priority group away from you, is by grabbing one of the bonds and rotating. Okay. Now, let me write another one, and then, then, we'll, then you can figure out if it's R or S. Because that's the one I grabbed. So, no models. Model. The pen is my, I'm out of hands. The pen, here's my three groups. Here's my pen as the fourth one. Okay, imagine these are still here. I'm going to grab this and I'm going to rotate this way so that those groups rotate like this. You all, if you have three fingers intact, you will always have sort of a tetrahedron with the fourth bond here. So I'm rotating it this way by grabbing it. I could do the same thing on, I could have done the same thing with four. If I would have grabbed four, then I would rotate three into one, one into two, and two into three. So if you think about what were we doing with, what were we kind of doing with Newman projections or sawhorses? Forget about the other half of the sawhorse. I could rotate this position here, this position here, and that one all the way to the top. So I can grab any of the bonds and do that. Of course, it's not going to be helpful to grab the fourth, or to grab the dashed wedge, because that's where the fourth group needs to go. So I could grab any of those bonds and rotate one into another. And if you don't quite see this, make a model, or if you need a model, come and get one from me, and then you can kind of see how you would rotate the groups. So let me come up with one here. I'm just going to show numbers, all right? Because I'm probably going to, well, I'm not going to show numbers for all of our, for all of these, but it really does boil down to just numbers. And then we're going to go through all the permutations of this. All right, let's say I put number four here, one here, two there, and three there. So my question is going to be, and I'll need to load up the top hat um, in a moment. So for that orientation, put the four away from me and tell me if it's R or S. That's the question. And A will be R. No, you know what? I'll make it a text question, and then you can just type in R or S. Capital letters, please, so that it collates all of them. So you can use capital R or capital S. Where is my top hat?
I probably did for the other class. Hold on. Yes, I did for the other class. Let me get to your class. So just capital R or capital S. person okay let's see what we've got 21 R's and 8 S's okay let's see so 4 has to go in the back so there's a couple ways you could do that you could grab number three and then rotate four into one, one into two, then two into four. And if we do that, then four comes over here, one goes here, and then two goes here. So now the fourth is on the is on a dashed wedge, going from one to two to three then is clockwise. So that chiral centers are. Any questions? So that's one way to do it. Um, there is another method called group switching. In, your, in the folder for Monday or today, one of the two, there is Stereochemistry for Dummies, which is a chapter from Organic Chemistry for Dummies, Volume 1. There's two volumes. The um, Stereochemistry for Dummies has a method that I call group switching that is not in any of the organic books, as far as I can tell. Why? Um, I don't think it's, you know, I don't think it's super secret, but, and I don't know where I pick this up, um, because I can't identify, did I learn this in undergraduate? Um, there was probably a good eight or ten year span when I wasn't dealing with chiral centers, and then I started teaching and I had to go back and I'm like, oh, I remember doing it this way. And I have no idea where it came from. But one of the reasons it's not in organic books is because the purest organic chemist would like you to think in three dimensions and be able to manipulate the molecule in three dimensions in your head. If not all of us are able to do that under time pressure and um, you can't use models on standardized tests, you do have a somewhat of a tetrahedron here, but you know, that'll get you so far. Then we have 
an issue of, well, is there another way of doing this? And the answer is yes. So group switching has, you're going to switch two groups any number of times. And if you group switch any even number of times, then the chiral carbon stays the same. Its configuration stays the same. If you groups, if you switch any two groups any odd number of times, then the chiral center becomes opposite in configuration. So the key is switching two groups to put the four group away from you but then also preserving the original stereochemistry. So normally we switch two groups twice. We switch a pair of groups two times. So here's, here's the same molecule, so I should get the same answer. If I don't, then that's going to be a fail. So let's move, let's move the four to the back position. So let's switch number four and number one. So I have now done one switch. If I now determine the chiral center's configuration, it will be opposite of what it started with. Now if your mind works that way, make one switch, determine the answer, and write the other one down. If your mind doesn't work that way, then let's make another switch so that what we find is the same as the original. So now I can switch any other two groups. I could switch four and one again, and I'm back to the beginning. Or I could switch one and three. I usually like to switch the other two. So I like to switch two and three. So now I've switched two groups twice. Whatever my configuration is now should be what it was originally. And going from 1 to 2 to 3 is what? Clockwise. And so this is R. So this is group switching. You switch any two number of group, any pair of groups, an even number of times. The goal being to put four away from you. And then you can and then determine the configuration. And the nice thing about group switching is that it works with anything. Okay. It'll work with any of the chiral centers that we're going to have. So really it depends on which one you want to use. If you want to use rotation or if you want to use group switching. So that, and it's completely outlined in that, in that uh, stereochemistry for dummies text. That's why I included it, because th that's the only place it's documented. Okay. Like I said, the organic purists would be like, but you're not seeing it in your head. Yeah, I know. But as long as you're getting the right answer, I guess that's all that matters. I'm not necessarily a purist on this. It'd be helpful to be able to see things in our head, but if we can't, we need another method. So there's the other method. Okay. And I will, let's see, I will also, after class, I'll put on a little exercise that we did in lab last year with, um, if you go to my, my uh, YouTube page, or if you just search my name and VR demo, there are there's a stereo view of some molecules and how to like see the three D and how to walk around it and stuff from our from our VR um, stuff that we have with computer science. Um, we'll get to a point where people may be able to use that live, but it you can see it on your phone kind of the three dimensions and okay. If I want the red one in the back, how should I approach it? Um, if you want to begin to see it in 3D, but this is another method group switching. Now, what other molecules can I manipulate? This, 
is called a Fisher projection. And also, some of the problems in the book may ask you to sort of, is here's a structure, which one of these structures is the same? So you might have to do some three-dimensional thinking in order to figure out which groups are the same. You could always do it by configuration. You could always say, okay, this one has an R, which one of these has an R? Um, but you can also, you know, you, you'll have to manipulate, I think, some of those problems. But here's a Fisher projection. Now, Fisher projection is written as a plus. It is basically a... bow tie structure is how I remember it. So in this case the molecule is oriented so that these two horizontal positions are pointing towards you. And then the other two positions are pointing away from you. And you'll see this most commonly in biochemistry. And I'll show some sugars, or we'll show uh, this couple molecules in a Fisher projection. But when you see molecules that are looking like this, and maybe they have something like an aldehyde up here, and then they have all these different groups, and then a CH2OH down here, when you see those in biology, they're Fisher projections of sugars. And so they're using that representation to show the stereochemistry. So Fisher projections are bow ties, the two positions towards you and then two positions away from you. So if I had a Fisher projection where I had number four, number two, number one, and number three, and again, bold and dashed, I have to somehow manipulate that molecule into four being on a dashed wedge. Okay. So in this case, if you could see the molecule so that the two positions are, so the two positions are here pointing towards you and then the other two are like this, you could begin to manipulate that. There's some things that the book will tell you never do. You never rotate these. So you've got to somehow manipulate this. This is one where the group switching, I think, works great. So, in a minute, what is, what's the configuration of this, of that molecule? Again, capital R, capital S. In theory, you could probably grab any one of these groups and make a rotation and rotate it from one to the, the other three groups sort of in a circular pattern. But you can also just switch the two groups. All four has to do is go on a dash wedge.
the last one. Okay, 22 S's and 7 R's. So let's see where I'm gonna, how I'm going to do this. So I can switch four with either two or three. As long as it's on a dashed wedge, it doesn't matter. So in this case, I'll switch, I'll switch four and two, and then I will switch three and one. So now I've done two, I've switched two groups twice. Going from one to two to three is now counterclockwise, which means that is S. So that's a Fisher projection. And one of the reasons, I, like I said, I show the group switching is because I think for Fisher projection, it's a lot easier way of doing it. And we're working on a, we're working on a VR module to try and get a Fisher projection into a tetrahedron. But right now I don't have control enough over the initial molecule to do that. When I do it, I'll videotape it and put it on put it in the canvas or put it on YouTube and a link to it in the canvas folder if you wanted to see. You could also again just take take a model and so how would I manipulate it to turn it into a tetrahedron? Okay. So those are two of the those are two of the molecules, two of the representations that we have to deal with. Now we're also going to have to deal with cyclohexanes. Newman projections and sawhorses. But what I want to go to is I want to introduce a a third type of stereo well a third stereo stereochemical term. And here's how I'm gonna do it. I'm gonna take and I'm gonna write my molecule in my I'm going to use like a pseudo Fisher projection. So I'm not going to write it as horizontal bonds. I'm going to explicitly show the bolds and dashes. So let's say I put a hydrogen here. I put a methyl group here. I put an OH group there. Down here, maybe I'll put an aldehyde group. And then I'll put an A, well, no. I want to start, I want to start fairly simple here. So I don't want to... So I want to put an aldehyde group here, an H here, and then maybe I'll put another OH there. So this molecule now has two chiral centers. And the rule for the number of possible stereoisomers that you can have is two to the N. So the total number of stereoisomers that you can, that a molecule has is 2 to the n, where n is the number of chiral centers. So it's real simple when you have one chiral center, it's 2 to the first, so it's either R or S. But when you have multiple chiral centers like this one, there's two squared number of stereoisomers, so that means there's four. And what I want to do is I want to draw all four of them and talk about their their relationships to each other. Okay. So I'm going to rewrite this molecule down here because I wrote that up there and that's going to block my space. So I'm going to have my OH and my CH3 and then my I guess I wrote a carboxylic acid, it doesn't matter. And then an OH. Okay. Now we can assign R and S values to each of these two carbons. And maybe we'll do that in a minute or two. But here's what I want to do. I want to write this molecule an antiomer. So I'm going to call this molecule A. So let's write its mirror image isomer. And so mirror image
So there's its mirror image, which is B. So the first, so A and B are mirror image isomers. They are not superimposable on each other. Because there's no way that I can make the left-handed one into the right-handed one. If you moved the left molecule over on the right one, the OH would be matching up with the CH3. You could say, how about rotating it? Okay, great, I rotate it, but then the OH is, one OH is up and one OH is down. So I cannot make these two molecules superimpose on each other. But they are mirror images, non-superimposable, therefore A and B are enantiomers. This is a pair, these are a pair of enantiomers. A and B are enantiomers. But what if I change the configuration of the top or the bottom carbon? So how about I change the top one? So, well, or I'll change the bottom one. So in, the, so in my next molecule here, I'm going to have the original top configuration. The CH on the left and the OH on the right. But now I'm going to change the bottom configuration so that from, from A, so that it looks like this with the OH there and the C double bond OH there, and then the H there. So now molecule C has the same configuration for the top carbon as A, but it has the bottom configuration of B. So what is C a mirror image of? Is, is C a mirror image of A? Is it a mirror image of B? It's going to be the mirror image of D, but it's not the mirror image of A or B. It's got a new set of configurations. We could go through and find out whether it's R, R, S, S, or R and S. But this one has, this one is not the mirror image of B or A. So now we have another relationship that I have to define. And so my definition, my new definition is going to be of what's called a diastereomer. Right, just a couple letters away from being a disastomer. So diastereomers are non-superimposable non mirror image isomers and what does that mean well it means exactly what it says they're not mirror images and they're not superimposable but yet it is a stereo they're stereoisomers they have the same connectivities but different three-dimensional structures. So C and B are diastereomers, and C and A are diastereomers. And there's an operational definition that we could use if we determine R and S configurations for this, and that is that if you have enantiomers, all the chiral centers have opposite configurations. 
So when you have two enantiomers, they have to have opposite configurations for every single chiral center. And if you figured out the, the R and S values for these, for A and B, you would find that's the case. For diastereomers, though, at least one chiral center is the same, has the same configuration, and at least one has the opposite. So for diastereomers, one of one of their one of the chiral centers is going to be the same, one is going to be opposite. And we can see that the way I drew it out. So operationally then, enantiomers always have opposite configurations for everything, for every chiral center. Diastereomers is at least one same, at least one different. So C, diastereomers of C are A and B. Diastereomers of B is C. Diastereomer of A is C. Now there's a fourth one I can draw. And I'm going to have to draw it down here smaller because I didn't leave myself enough space. And that is to draw the mirror image now of draw the mirror image of C. Which I just did not do. So the mirror image of C is going to have OH on the left, CH3 on the right, OH on the left, and C double bond O, OH on the right, and then the H down below. So this is molecule D. And so D is a mirror image of C. So C and D are enantiomers. And D is a diastereomer of A and B. Does everybody kind of see that? So when we go to more than one chiral center, every molecule is going to have, oh, I'm going to complicate it in a minute or in four days. When you have a molecule, it has one and only one mirror image. But if there's more than one chiral center, it may have multiple diastereomers because the diastereomer you're just changing one chiral center as opposed to having to change all of them. So every molecule has a mirror image but it may have two or three diastereomers. So in this case A has one mirror image, and that's B, but it has two diastereomers, which are C and D. And that's the case for all of these. And if you had 26 chiral centers, you have one molecule, it has one and only one mirror image. And then it's got whatever 2 to the 25th is, number minus one of diastereomers. Now, why is this important? Well, we've I introduced the idea of chirality with the gloves the other day. You know, the lab gloves that aren't chiral, but my hand that is, and it and they fit. But then when I go to a chiral glove in the wrong hand that doesn't fit, sort of as an example of how chiral molecules will react with other chiral molecules. But 
if we talk about the relationships between enantiomers, what we're going to find is that in terms of physical properties, enantiomers have exactly the same physical properties. Same boiling point, same melting point. I shoot them into a GC, I get one peak, unless I do something special. I take a TLC, um, the thin layer chromatography that we did in lab, I'm going to get one spot, unless I do something special to the TLC plate. The only physical property that's different between enantiomers is how they rotate plane polarized light, which we'll get into on, on Monday. That's the only physical property that's different. So separating enantiomers is incredibly difficult, unless I do something special, which again, I'll show you on Monday. Now diastereomers, a pair of diastereomers, they have different physical properties. They don't have to have the same physical properties. Di enantiomers do, diastereomers don't. So if you have two diastereomers, they can have different melting points. They may be pretty close, but they're different. You put them into a uh, GC, you'll see two peaks if you have it set up properly. TLC, two spots, different densities, different all different physical properties are different. They may be very close, but they're different. And antimers, they gotta be exactly the same. So that is something we're gonna, uh, we're gonna talk about on Monday as well in terms of the diastereomers will have different physical properties, but in antimers, don't. They have the same physical properties. So now I've introduced a new type of stereochemistry. Okay. And there's another type of stereochemistry that I can add when you have multiple chiral centers. And I'll just introduce this very quickly like this and say, There are two mirror image isomers. Each of these two carbons is chiral, because it's got four different groups attached to it. Are those two molecules superimposable? Give me an answer. Take a guess. Yes. Yes, good guess. They are superimposable. Say, so how do I know that? Well, let's rotate this molecule 180 degrees in the plane of the screen. So I'm, I'm just taking it, and I'm just mm -hmm. taking it like this, and I'm going like this. What's it going to look like? going to look like that. I didn't flip it, I just rotated it in the plane of the, plane of the screen. They're superimposable. Yet, they have chiral centers. Are they chiral molecules themselves? And what does it mean to be chiral? It means that you have a mirror image that you're not superimposable upon. And the answer is these molecules are not chiral, yet they have chiral centers. So this is a new type of stereochemistry that we have to deal with. What happens if you have chiral centers but you are superimposable on your mirror image? Then you are called a meso compound. And, and meso compounds then reduce the number of total stereoisomers when you have a meso compound 
by one. If I went back to this, and this is where I'll shut up and quit. If I went and I made one A such that the top three groups were the same as the bottom three groups, eventually I'll form two structures that have a mirror plane that cuts through the center of it so that I have a meso compound. Well, two of the compounds are going to be meso. They're going to be mirror images, but they're going to be superimposable on each other. So when you have a molecule like that, kind of two Fischer project, the two chiral carbons in the Fischer projection, when the top carbon has the same three groups as the bottom carbon, you might be in a position where those two, where those are meso. And so therefore they're superimposable. So we'll have to deal with meso compounds as a new type of stereochemistry. So on Monday, I'm going to go over and I'll have PowerPoints for you the physical property difference as well as how we can determine whether molecules um, are chiral uh, and then how we, can how we can kind of separate them or analyze them and the importance of like chiral drugs um, using some stuff that we, some, some research as well as some real examples. So that's what we will do on Monday. If you have any questions, as always, email me, come by. Um, but the chapter, our chapter five problems will be due on Monday at midnight. So if you have any of those, you can email me over the weekend, et cetera. Okay. I'll take your uh, take home quizzes on the table and then I'll have all that stuff for you on Monday as well.